Good evening, everyone. You know what? In the spirit of the twins walking in and giving everybody a thumbs up, can we just greet the person next to you? Um, I'm telling you, welcome to On Ramps, but can you give somebody a thumbs up? High five. Uh, I'm glad to see that you survived the heat wave. Uh, yes, all, all that good stuff. All that good stuff. It's good. Yes, Maria's like, hallelujah, we all survived the heat wave. <laughs> Good news, good news, y'all. It's going to be in the 90s for the next couple days. It's going to be in the 90s, all right? Who would have thought we would have been praying for the 90s? I don't know. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. It's crazy. That's crazy. All right. Well, welcome to On Ramps Covenant Church. Oh, take a selfie. Let's do that. We haven't done that in a while. We're doing that tonight, PE? All right. PE wants to take selfies, so we're going to do that. So go ahead. If you feel comfortable, grab some selfies with some people. Oh, that's me. like to invite up our children at this time. If you are an R spacer, we're going to ask you to stay in the gathering because you have a very important role for us today. But if you are a journey kid, come on up. We would love to pray for you and we will send you to your classes. We talked about this before, but worship is not just through music, right? Worship is everything we do. The kids get to go worship as they learn and as they spend time with one another. Come on down. up here right now. They're all over there, but that's fine. We're going to pray for them anyway. <laughs> Would you please extend a hand towards our youth? And you know that there are many of our kids over in another room. You know who they are. You can hold their images in your mind as we're praying for them. So God, we lift up your children to you. We thank you that you have been caring for them for years and years already, whether they are two years old or they're 70 years old, right? We're all your children. God, we thank you for the way that you've been uh, impacting their lives already, the way that you have been encouraging them and strengthening them and just showing them more of who you are and more of who they are in you. We ask for a special blessing on their time tonight, that they would be able to learn, see you in a fresh way, experience something new of you tonight. And God, we just recommit ourselves as a community to be there for these kids. We thank you for the honor of trusting us to care for one another in community, trusting us to care for your children. Amen. This is running after. So much, worship team. Y'all don't know, stuff happens in the background. Changes happen. People step in and do things. 
things that they were asked to do at the last minute, thank you so much, worship team. We appreciate you all. I would like you, before we do anything else, first of all, my name is Jessica. It's good to see you all. If I don't know you, it's great to meet you. Um, before we do anything, I have, I need a couple minutes to set up something over here. So I'm going to ask our space students to come this way. And we're going to grab a couple of those bean bags. So come on up. I want you, though, if you are not an art space student, I want you to ask your neighbor, <laughs> who's your favorite non-human relative? But let me say that again. The question is, who's your favorite non-human relative? By that I mean a plant, an animal, a fungi, bacteria, if you're into that stuff. I don't know. So ask your neighbor, what's your favorite non-human relative? All right, anybody want to share? Who's your favorite non-human relative? Just shout it out. My dog. The dog? Who else? Bougainvilleas. I never learned to pronounce that correctly, so I appreciate you saying it for me. The hummingbirds outside our house. I love those guys. A fox in your neighborhood. Yes. Yes. A dog, Charlie. I know Charlie. Yes. All of the friends at the Chaffee Zoo. Absolutely precious. Yeah, Jackie said, I'm going to put all the friends in one category. Um, second question, ask your neighbor, what is your favorite place to encounter God's creation? What's your favorite place to encounter God's creation? All right. The question is, where is your favorite place to encounter God's creation? I'd love to hear your thoughts if you have something to share. The sky. The mountains. The forest. Say it again. Oh, the front yard. Yes. Okay. So I'm asking these questions because I, <laughs> I like to think of myself as like a nature kid, or you could also think about it as like a creation kid, and I'll tell you why. But first off, you might have noticed we have a little slice of God's creation right here in front of me, my pride and joy, Jean Parmesan. Give her a hand, please. <laughs> but more importantly, we have some of the R Space kids who are up here taking care of Jean Parmesan. And the reason that Jess and I wanted to do this is to give you all just like the tiniest little glimpse into our experience at Unite. So we went to the Unite Youth Conference two weeks ago. We went to San Diego. And my absolute favorite part of the whole trip was seeing these teenagers take care of the cat. 100% my favorite part of the trip. We had times of worship, we had times of connecting with each other, we had times of really deep conversation, but there was something very special to me about seeing young people taking care of a little precious animal. And we'll talk about that. So thank you all for being here and helping me out. So like I said, we had a great time over there. And I'm not going to talk too much about Unite tonight, but what I want to do instead is give you not actually a lot of content. What I want to do tonight is I want to create space for you to have your own encounter with God in a fresh way. <laughs> she's good. She's good. If she, uh, just try to keep her in this area. So you might want to, yeah, yeah. Because she'll run also. She'll run away. So I want to give you some space to encounter God in a fresh way tonight. What I'm going to share is some of my own journey, how one particular scripture has changed and impacted my life. And then I want to talk about how to keep paying attention to God through some tools in our spiritual tool belt. And if you've heard me talk here before, you know that I'm all about the spiritual practices, the disciplines, the tools that you get to put in your spiritual tool belt. So we'll talk about that. We are going old school on ramps tonight with some stations because stations for me are something that have really shaped my own faith profoundly. And I thought maybe that would be for you too. Stations allow us some freedom to 
to connect with God in different ways. So I won't talk too long, and then we'll have some stations. Come on in. You're good. You're good. Um, but first of all, I want to tell you about who I was before most of y'all knew me. So let's see. Which button, Pastor Eric? The, the arrow? Aha. This is me when I was a very small child. And like I said, I like to think of myself as like a nature kid or like a creation kid. I have always been a kid who loved animals, always been a kid who was like excited to be outdoors, excited to be connected to God's creation in some way. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma and for four or five years in Oklahoma, I was living on five acres. So we had basically like a big forest, like a wooded area in our backyard. And it was really special to be able to live in a place where I was so proximate and like so adjacent to creation in that way. So I was a kid enamored with God's creation. When I was almost eight, my family had a baby boy. His name is Spencer. He's now a full adult. He has a baby of his own. But it was a really meaningful experience for me as a big sister to be able to like care for this new baby who was around. Uh, my family was also a cycling family. So even when Spencer was a little baby, we'd go around on the rides. And my dad like learned the art of you know <laughs> making sure the child was safe on the back of the bike while he was like falling asleep. At one point, um, you see the helmet there? They had to take the helmet and like duct tape it to the back of the seat so he would like stay upright while he was riding around. And also I just love my parents' outfit in this picture. So, you know, the drip is uh, dripping. <laughs> one of my favorite animals, one of my favorite non-human relatives when I was a kid was my grandfather's dog named Rocky. My family never had dogs, we just mostly had cats. But Rocky, for me, this little dog, <laughs> he was like my companion. He was really like my dog best friend. We would go on adventures in the park. I would imagine that we were like on medieval quests and that he was my little adventure sidekick or that he was like my steed as I was trying to figure out how to save the kingdom from whatever. And Rocky was really special to me, and it's cool because I got to see this dog grow up as I was growing up. When I was in high school, my love for God's creation was manifested in something called the Green Club. Um, and if you see these really cool shirts, my dad designed those, and my dad made these shirts say, live green and prosper. Um, and that was one way for me as a high school student to like live out my faith, because my faith was there's something about God's earth and something about God's creation that requires care. And I feel like part of my job is to do that, to respond to God's love in that way. Um, so we had a really fun time. We were recycling. We were uh, planting some flowers at Tanaya Middle School. Um, and it was really cool because also in high school, I was part of a camp called Camp Keola. And Camp Keola is one of my favorite places in the world. This is a very special place to me. It's up near Huntington Lake, very small, like rustic Mennonite camp, just kind of cabins, nothing fancy at all, very dusty. It's the kind of camp where you come home after a week and your toes are just uh, full of dust. <laughs> you know, that kind of place. Um, so my one of my favorite places to encounter God's creation was here at Camp Keola. And I was able to start as a counselor in training, and then I was able to be a speaker at the camp, and then I was leading the camp eventually. And it was such a special experience because I got leadership development, and people trusted me that I was able to invest in their kids in some particular way. Um, but all around us, we were surrounded by God's creation, and we were in this wilderness environment that just had a really unique um, opportunity for us to encounter God. My role as far as work before I came to On Ramps was as a youth minister, and I was a youth minister at a place called Mennonite Community Church. We had a very tiny youth group, and towards the end of my time there, I had the honor of baptizing some of our youth kids, and I also got baptized the same time 
And for whatever reason, we are, you know, a very small DIY Mennonite congregation where a bunch of people were excited about nature. And we decided to go get baptized in a lake. And I had an issue with the baptism where I, oh, thank you. Good job. I had an issue with the baptism where I felt super off balance and my leg just like fully came out of the water. So I feel like there's a whole sermon on trust in that one, but I'm, you know, unpacking that. But even the fact that my baptism happened in a lake, I think is just a testament to the fact that like, I've been connected to God's creation in a particular specific way ever since I was a little kid. And maybe this story is familiar to you too. In all this, I grew up knowing that there was, knowing there was some sort of special connection between God and nature, or God's creation, or as some like to call it, our non-human relatives. And as I got older, I started to learn more about the different ways that people experience God, and I learned that not everyone experiences God the same way or through the same things. I learned about a spiritual temperament framework called the sacred pathways. Y'all heard about sacred pathways? Okay. It's kind of like a, it's a spiritual temperament assessment where it helps you understand maybe some ways that you particularly connect to God that may be similar or different than those around you. And for me, I started learning, oh my gosh, one of the ways that I connect to God is as a caregiver. One of the ways is as a contemplative. And people can have, you know, connections to all of these different nine pathways. But a big one for me was as a naturalist, meaning you experience God in nature. Honestly, so simple, not complicated, just the idea that there's a special way to connect to God through the natural world. And so that's the one that we're gonna be focusing on today is this path of the naturalist. And over the years, I started to realize something. I realized that one of the reasons I experienced God through nature, the non-human relatives, and one of the reasons that was so connected to my faith was because of the Sermon on the Mount. Because when I was in fifth grade, my Sunday school teacher had us memorize Matthew 6, 25 through 33. And I told you I grew up Anabaptist or Mennonite. That's not a tradition where we memorize a lot of scripture. And so for me, like memorizing this particular scripture was a very special experience because it didn't happen often. So this was one of the scriptures that really stuck with me. Matthew 6, 25 through 33 is often called the do not worry or the do not be anxious passage. And it's situated in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5 through 7. One time, I was in a college class where we actually memorized the entire Sermon on the Mount, and I did it. For my final assessment, I was able to memorize all three chapters. I was so proud of myself, and of course I forgot by now, because it was a long time ago. But even in the process of preparing this message, I felt this invitation to go back to the Sermon on the Mount and re-memorize it, because I think one thing OnRamps has taught me is the power of memorizing scripture, the power of internalizing God's word and being able to hold it in your heart with you. Let's talk about the Sermon on the Mount. If you've been in Tuesday night Bible study, you've been studying this a lot, right? How many weeks have y'all been studying the Sermon on the Mount? (laughs) Several, a few, uh uh-huh. So the Sermon on the Mount is some of Jesus' most focused and challenging teaching to his disciples. It's like the teaching to his inner circle and those who are saying that they are committed, they are ready to give their whole life to Jesus. It's this incredibly important passage of scripture in the spiritual tradition of Anabaptism or Mennonites that I was raised in. There's an Anabaptist author named Mary Schertz and she said, The Sermon on the Mount is the thorn in our side and the rainbow in our sky, discomforting and comforting by turn, but always calling us beyond our perspective to a more joyous and loving existence. But it's not easy. It's not easy information to read and then say, great, I'm ready to just put this into action right away. But the Sermon on the Mount is important. It tells us uh, this, you've heard it said one way, but the Jesus way is something different. And sometimes in the Sermon on the Mount, the Jesus way is to love your enemies, or not seek retaliation, or give sacrificially, or trust God's providence when it seems illogical and impossible. So let's take a look at this passage that I memorized as a fifth grader. And you can turn, if you'd like to, with us. We're going to look at Matthew 6. 25 through 33, 
And because I'm talking a lot, I would love to hear from y'all. Do I have one volunteer who would like to read the NIV version? And then I would love to have a volunteer read the King James, oh, thank you, and the message. Do I have a volunteer for the NIV? Maria? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't fight over scripture. Here you go. All right. I could just read it from the screen here. So, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor, or reap or store away in barns, and yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you, not, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is, where, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Thank you so much. Round of applause, please. Thank you. Could we have a reader for a different version? The King James Version, maybe this is what you have grown up reading. I would love a reader for this one. Is that a hand? Ah, thank you, Bill. Let's go. Uh, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, yet ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, yet he shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Did I say that right? Okay. Uh, behold the fowls of the air, for they shall not. Neither they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father readeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you taking thought can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that, uh, that even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow, tomorrow his, is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have not all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Thank you so much. Round of applause, please. Good job. And... One more, because it's worth it to read scripture multiple times, and it's worth it to notice new things in different translations. One more. Yes, go right ahead. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. And you count far more to him than birds. 
has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at these fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting, so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Amen. Thank you so much. Round of applause, please. Thank you. I want to point out one thing that Eugene Peterson does in the message that I think is so interesting. On the far right column, about one third of the way down, he says, what I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. I love that. And I want us to notice a few things that Jesus is doing in this text. This is the book of Matthew. This is Jesus speaking during the Sermon on the Mount, right? Where he's talking to his inner circle, the disciples who've said, yes, we're all in, we're ready to go. He's giving them uh, the hard stuff. <laughs> he's contrasting life with eating and drinking. He's contrasting the body, the physical body with clothes. He's reminding us of what's actually most important and the things that God has created and given us, the things that God is providing on a basic level. We're talking about God's provision here. And he uses the examples of things that his disciples would see every day in life as they're just going about doing their normal daily lives, right? It's so interesting to me too, because as the disciples' lives are just being like fully upended by Jesus, they're all still maybe going to their regular jobs, maybe seeing their regular friends, looking at the same landscape. So they're looking in the air, they're seeing these birds, they're looking at the ground, they're seeing these flowers at the same time that they're encountering Jesus and understanding God's vision for the world in a way they had never envisioned it before. So that kind of blows my mind. Anyway, he's using the examples of things they would see every day. The birds, they're just taking what they need every day. No strategy, no quarterly reporting, no birds sitting around a little business meeting, you know, in a conference room. That would be really cute. But the birds, <laughs> the birds are just taking the manna that they need day by day, just one day at a time, probably one meal at a time. They're taking what they need for their nest just day by day. God is providing for the birds, the flowers, they don't work to spin, which just means to create fabric or like to weave textiles. The flowers just exist. They grow up, they look at the sky, they grow towards the sun, and they're more beautiful than Solomon. And Solomon, the audience would know as the most wealthy king in Israel's history. Solomon, uh, Jesus says that even Solomon's splendor and luxury that all his wealth could buy could not measure up to the natural beauty of just a flower, something that just appeared from the field. Jesus says, do not be anxious, which to me can often feel like a statement of judgment, but I want us to think about it not as a statement of judgment, but a statement of invitation. He says, do not be anxious or do not worry because the Gentiles or the pagans seek after these things. What's he saying here? He's saying the behavior of those who do not trust God for their provision, that behavior is to scramble and hustle and like bite our nails about what the future holds. But the behavior of a disciple is just to take it one day at a time, like the bird getting what they need one day at a time, or the flowers looking at the sun, doing what they do, just existing one day at a time. The behavior of a disciple is to take it one day at a time and walk in trust with the God who is providing. 
Jesus is asking his disciples to remember other times that God has provided. Maybe they're thinking about the manna and the quail in, in Exodus 16. Maybe they're thinking about their own personal stories of provision, what happened with their family or what happened with their village, their community. For us, we also know the stories of Jesus feeding miracles in the gospels. We know the stories of provision even through like the bread and the drink symbolism of communion. God is providing over and over and over again, sometimes in these illogical and unexpected ways. And I'm sure a lot of us in this room have our own stories and testimonies of how God has provided for us. I know I have. The New Testament, as you might know, was written in Greek. And the word here for worry or be anxious or take ye thought in the King James Version that word I learned this week is Merriam now, and it has been described as an anxious endeavor to secure one's needs. That's really helpful for me, an anxious endeavor to secure my needs. So one option is to go about scrambling and hustling and doing everything possible to make sure all your needs are met. But the other way to go about it, like Jesus is inviting us to, is to trust and just go one day at a time. For me, that's very difficult. Because this scripture has been in my mind for the last like 25 years or so since I was a fifth grader, it has meant different things at different times. When I was really little, it meant the basics, that Jesus is paying attention to creation. It sounds like followers of Jesus should be paying attention to God's creation and that God cares for me. That's what I got when I was little. When I was in middle school, it meant that I did not need the name brand clothing or the name brand shoes to be valuable, which was great for me because my parents were not gonna buy those for me anyway. So I literally went back to the scripture and I was like, all right, I'm gonna be okay. They're not gonna buy me Converse <laughs> ever. <laughs> I'll be fine. <laughs> my parents are not gonna buy me these bands, but that's all right. Oh, thank you, please, please, please. <laughs> Um, when I had my first job, when I was uh, just entering the workforce for the first time, I guess, I was figuring out finances for the first time. It meant, this passage for me meant that I had to steward my money well. And it meant that I had to live simply with what I had, not blow it and not make money my focus. I remember the first time my parents said no to giving me money when I was broke at the end of the month and I thought about this scripture. I'm like, okay, maybe I have some poor spending choices. Maybe I need to reorient the way I'm thinking about finances. And as I kept moving along in my life, in your career, just as you go, for me, this scripture has been huge because it's helped me curb the impulse to strive for financial success and career achievement or recognition at like the cost of my own soul. Because of this scripture, I have not taken soul-sucking jobs simply because they pay the best. I've not stressed myself out with a million side hustles just to get ahead. I've not fallen for the lie that I must be a homeowner in order to be successful. And the narratives around those things are so strong, I have to keep going back to this scripture over and over for the last 20 years. But now, when I, I don't know if I wanna say most days, when I often experience anxiety or worry, especially about the pressures of life and productivity and the ways that we're told just to keep doing more and keep being more, when I experience those things, this scripture teaches me that if God cares so deeply for every tiny bird and every tiny flower and every little bee, every little bug that he created, God has his eye on me because he created me. And our worship songs say it, right? I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. Another song says, if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more will he clothe you? That's right from the scripture. If he watches over every sparrow, how much more does he love you? And it took me a long time for me to move beyond believing that God just wanted me to like do the right things, believe the right things, perform all the right like discipleship actions, and make sure that my external world was perfect. It took me a long time to actually get to the place of learning that I just exist and God loves me. 
I don't know if that's really easy for you to believe, but for me that has taken years and years and years and years just to believe that I just get to exist as a person without doing a single thing and God loves me. No earning, no working, no hustling for God's love. No sowing, no reaping, no storing away in barns, no laboring, no spinning. God loves us. And it's so simple. It blows my mind because it's so simple. But this is really the main thing that I want us all to hear tonight, is that God loves you without you doing a single thing. You just exist, do nothing at all, and God loves you. The way that you look at a flower in awe and just appreciate a flower for being itself the way that you listen to little birds chirping and just appreciate them for being birds and doing what they do, God loves you without you doing anything. God loves Jean, even though she's running away. <laughs> oh, she'll be fine, it's all right. There's an early church father from the fourth century. Uh, he's from Syria and his name was John Chrysostom. And he has a commentary on this passage, especially with that you idea, all the places in the passage where it says, are you not much more valuable? John Chrysostom says, the force of the emphasis is on the you to indicate how great is the value set upon your personal existence and the concern God shows for you in particular. Like you, not even us as a collective whom God loves, but you, just one person at a time, basking in the light of God's love, being loved by God for not doing anything at all. This blows my mind, y'all. One thing I love about on-ramps is how we love each other, how we care for each other, how we nurture one another, how you let me bring uh, this little you know, cat into church. I appreciate that. We have a lot of people in this room tonight that love each other so well and I just want to make sure we understand that that love is a reflection of God's love for us. The way that you take each other's kids to movies or take them to parks and don't charge the parents, right? The way that you bring a meal to someone who's sick and the way that you leave your Tupperware, them, Tupperware with them for them to use. The way that you check in with those who you haven't seen in a while, whether or not they reach out to you first. The way that you embrace a little baby when they have done nothing to earn your favor, when they're just existing. The way that you say, oh, when we see the R Space kids playing with a kitten. Even though this cat is not producing anything, she's not even a content creator, she's not performing or producing anything for us. This is how God loves us. I'm sure you have noticed that so many of our friends who live outside have pets with them. I think that they have pets because it's something to care for and nurture, and I pray that they are meeting God and experiencing God's love when they're caring for their pets in those moments. Every time you find yourself caring for and nurturing another part of God's creation, whether it's a human or not a human, you can be reminded of God's love for you, like in particular you. When we practice loving each other, we point to God's love for us. And the scripture tells us to do something else instead of all the worrying and the hustling. It says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus tells us, his disciples, the ones who are really committed and like ready to go all in, he tells us to reorient the way that we think about our needs and the way that we think about God's provision. When life is hard, we might be broke, and maybe we literally do not know what the future holds. I want to encourage us that God's creation still surrounds us and that it's worth a try to engage God's creation and reorient ourselves to a truth beyond our current circumstance. I know that's been true in my life. Uh, I heard from the Tuesday night Bible study that Lorraine and Lindsay had a really cool insight into the scripture and connected it with the Romans 12 exhortation to renew our minds, talking about renewing our minds into the belief that God like actually truly loves us, the belief that God cares about us, that you are God's beloved no matter how much you produce or achieve or do. When we stop working so hard, we can look around and we can see God caring for creation 
we get to remember that we also are part of creation and that we're being taken care of too. We're getting to the end of our message time, so y'all will have time for stations, but I wanna show you the last verse here that I actually didn't memorize when I was little, but I wanna read it to us. The last verse, Matthew 6, 34 says, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Another translation says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now, and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Last translation says, do not worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Living faithfully is a large enough task for today. You see on the screen here, our friend Eugene. And I wanna just get us to a place of reorienting a little bit when we think about the future and we think about the present. I know that we are a church that's going through changes. We are a church, we're a neighborhood that's going through changes. I know that life for a lot of us does get overwhelming and hard. And I also know that the heart of on-ramps is a healing community healing its community. Whatever changes we experience, we still have the capacity to love each other well. And I really want to exhort us in this season to just be present. Like, be in today when tomorrow seems like it wants to take all of our attention, when the future seems like it wants all of our energy. Be present. Be in today, and I'm telling this to myself too. We can live in God's love and be God's love to one another in this present moment. Our friend Eugene was one of the most incredible examples of someone who was just present. He was just there and like in the moment, a present guy. He shared God's love super freely. He encountered God's love through creation would always bring little friends to church. People called him the St. Francis of Fresno, and I just wanna say I'm doing my best to live up to Eugene's legacy, and I feel like the presence of Eugene makes us a better community, and I'm very, very thankful for Eugene. Before we transition to our stations, I just wanna say a couple things again to make sure that we hear them. And if you're like me, you've probably heard this for years, but maybe it took a long time to actually move from your head into your heart for you to believe it. So I'll say these again. Every time you find yourself caring for or nurturing another part of God's creation, you can be reminded of God's love for you. We practice loving each other, we point to God's love for us. And when we stop working so hard, look around and see God caring for his creation, we remember that we are a part of it and we are being taken care of too. At Unite, they taught us that if Jesus is our good shepherd, then we get to be the sheep. We have the pleasure of just being a little sheep. We get to rest in the presence of our savior and good shepherd, and we get to trust that we are safe and loved. So let's do this. We have nine options for stations, and by stations, I really mean options, because you get to choose wherever physically you would like to do these options, and you get to choose what you would like to do. Like we talked about spiritual disciplines or practices, or even just like experiencing God in new ways, those are all just tools that you put in your spiritual tool belt to help you pay attention to God. And Mark the other day said something really cool. He reminded me that God is always ready for us to encounter him. We just have to respond to God. So in this moment, we know God's been here, God's been working, but now we get to respond to God in this moment. So we have nine options, learn, I'm not gonna read all these, I've been talking too much. You have options, you can, bless you, you can learn, create, memorize, write, chat, walk, pray, listen, or see. 
And I have one table back here that has nine different info cards on it where you can pick up more information about exactly how to do one of those practices. I have another table in this corner over here where you can choose um, one of the info cards that'll tell you how to do a practice. You are totally welcome to take the info cards home for future use. You can choose one and do it for the whole station time, or you can choose three, whatever you want to do. This is really your time to respond to God in whatever way you would like to. Let me say one thing. I'm going to ask my R spacers, who did such a great job, to choose one of the options. And if you are someone who would like to choose option five, which is chat, just to like have a conversation about what you heard tonight. If you're a verbal processor and you want to talk about that immediately, come up this way and join us on the carpet. So let's pray and then we will be released for our stations. God, we thank you for the way that you've been meeting us already. We thank you for the way that you've been encountering us and drawing us to yourself. We thank you for the way that you love us, whether or not we recognize it. And God, in my own life, I thank you for all the people along the way who have proven your love to me and all my non-human relatives along the way that have helped me encounter your love. God, we ask that you would just be present in a fresh way tonight, that you would open our eyes and ears and senses to encounter you. Amen. All right, friends. And there's little info cards. My timer has run out, which tells us, hopefully, that you were able to choose at least one option in your stations. There are so many little info cards, though. You are totally welcome to take many home. If you felt like there was something you were interested in trying, but you didn't have a chance to do it, please take those home. Keep trying new things. Do something new. See if you experience God in a fresh way. I would just love to hear maybe like uh, three people if you, would, uh, if you would be interested in sharing something that you encountered during your station time or a new insight you have or a thought that you had. I would love to hear. You can shout it out. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't have to shout anymore. All right. Um, I did journaling, and this is something actually I, I, I talked about with Lindsay a couple of times. But what I enjoy about nature is when I look out into the ocean, um, I feel very tiny um, and uh, like um, vulnerable, um, but in relation to God's love, I'm reminded that I am surrounded and God's love is constant, whether they're big waves of his love or um, or small, tiny waves um, that God's love is constant. And that in that state of feeling vulnerable, I'm also safe um, in God's presence. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Yes, snaps, please. Thank you. That's beautiful. Anybody else resonate when you feel like the ocean gives you that sense? Yeah, thank you so much. I would love to hear two more people if you'd like to share. Say it again. So basically, like, if you did any of those options, just if you had, like, something you experienced or a thought that you want to share from your station time. Excellent. Share with us. Let's see if it reaches you. That is kind of. <laughs> um, I have a scripture here, so this scripture has been uh, very kind to me uh, throughout my Christian walk, which I'm still fairly new to. Uh, so this is out of the book of Jeremiah, and it's in chapter 33, verse 3, and it says, uh, Call to me, and I will answer you, 
and I will tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. So that helps me because there was like a time where I was like, God, who are you? You know what I mean? I had no clue who he was until I went to the mission, uh, the program I'm in currently. And I was just like so broken, you know, and I didn't really have any other options. Uh, so I was just like, okay, Lord, um, I'm going to give you a shot, you know. So this verse really stood out to me because I, I called him, you know, and like the good God he is, he answered me. And he is still teaching me to this day things that I have never, ever knew in my life. Amen. Yes, thank you so much. That's so, like, it's such an exciting journey, too. And like I shared, like, I'm still chewing on things that I, someone taught me 20 years ago, and I'm just now understanding them. So thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. I got one more. Somebody wants to share. Who is it? Yes, sir. Will we reach? Let's see. We'll find out. Uh, I did uh, number nine, C. Um, and it just, you know, it, I'm glad we had the full 25 minutes. So thank you for that. Because I feel like it would be really easy to um, kind of cash out with familiarity, like things you already know about, and then get bored. And then we have like 15 more minutes. So I have to keep thinking about it. Right? Um, and I, I got thinking about um, Jesus' miracles and how I, I think because we as a culture are just so, I don't know, like so, so ready to understand, oh yeah, Jesus did miracles and stuff. We forget, that's weird. Like that's super weird. Uh, and, and it would be one thing to be like, you know, a bunch of disciples out on a boat and you look over and there's Jesus just going for a walk you know, like that's a miracle and that's like, wow, astonishing. And then we tend to sort of cash that out and like, oh, look, he's divine. Great. Right. But like, I don't know, I was thinking like, what's Jesus doing on the shore before that? Is he stretching? Is he like, you know, is he, is he think like, what's, what's his thought process like as he's doing that, right? He's like, well, time to go for a stroll on the water. Like, is, I, I can't imagine that's what he's thinking. Right? Like he's engaging in a prophetic, symbolic action. So like what's he doing as he prepares for that? And, and how does he prepare himself for that in such a way that like his disciples are so blown away by it that it's become part of our storytelling uh, for 2,000 years? You know, um, it, it, I guess it's like just a way of kind of reapproaching and reconsidering those pieces of the Bible that become so familiar to us that we forget like the, um, like the intent behind it. What is Jesus trying to do with that? He's not just there announcing something about his divinity, right? He's, he's like engaging in a, a really rich prophetic action that ties into this long history. So I don't know, it, it was just like a, a good opportunity to sit, I think, and, and kind of reflect for a while and meditate on these things and sort of think uninterrupted and have a guide to work through all that, so thanks. Awesome. Love that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Man, I feel like that's a good invitation just to like keep slowing down, observing, <laughs> gazing at flowers, gazing at birds. Uh, next time you see a part of God's creation pop up unexpectedly, just take 30 seconds and stop what you're doing and engage with it. That's my last exhortation today. But thank you for sharing that. And I think, um, yeah, just the invitation to keep like going back to things that are familiar to us. God is at work all day long, all the time, in all places. There's always something new to experience of God. There's always a fresh way to encounter God. And we just have to have our eyes open. So Thank you all so much for doing this with me. I appreciate it. As we end today, the kids are over in the activity center area. If you would please take your chairs and move them to the chair hanging area, that would be great. Oh, and also we have, um, like I said, lots of little info cards where you can take some home with you as well. I wanna say one more thing, and then we will end with Psalm 23. The last thing I wanna say is that we have our family meeting tomorrow at 2 p.m. right here. 
Highly encouraged if you're able to make it. You're going to hear some updates about church. If you're a missional member, we have some things to vote on. And that's a way that we are going to be part of a community together and keep moving forward together. Awesome. Would you say this with me? We'll do it as a liturgy together to end our time. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thank you all.